painting class, your third project is an uh, um, abstract painting. Now there's two types of abstract. There's objective and non-objective. Objective simply means that there was an object that you started with. It may be hard to recognize by the time the piece is finished, but there's an object involved. Non-objective is simply a design. There's no object there. Now, I've chosen some paintings by Marc Chagall to show you some examples of objective abstracts. Why is this an abstract? Well, you've got you know, pictures inside of an of a animal's head. You've got uh, figures that are upside down, right side up. It, scale is mixed up everywhere. And you know, also color. You've got green faces. You've got all kinds of things. So this would be an example of an objective abstract because there's lots of, of objects involved. Once again, objective abstract. Why is it an abstract? Well, you've got a man who's also a bass viol. You've got a goat playing a violin. You've got his, you know, his face is on two sides. You've got a profile as well as looking straight at it. Definitely an abstract. Another example of an abstract, objective abstract, I mean, you've got a chicken that's almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. You've got the Eiffel Tower who is uh, basically uh, human. Uh, you've got these figures in the background. You've got the buildings there that are quite small. And so this is once again an objective abstract. Now, this is a painting by Morris Lewis. You can see that it's colors, uh, no real shapes involved, and it also is, has a very large scale to it. There's an example, that's the same painting. You know, he was actually pouring paints on canvases, and so here's one where he's got different colors moving up and down. Here are a little bit darker in tone. Here are bigger bodies of color. But once again, there is no real object in there. It's all about creating a feeling, a design, um, an impression, things like that. Now these are more non-objective abstracts. This is Robert Motherwell. He liked to work large, although sometimes he would do prints that were, you know, a little bit, you know, quite a bit smaller. He liked to use contrast between very dark and very light values. So he used black and white quite a bit. This gives you an idea of the scale of his paintings. Very large. Uh, so this is a gallery and there's three of his paintings together. Let's talk about our brushes for a moment. Brushes are quite expensive. To get a good brush for the, uh, the bristles bounce back, you know, you want to make sure that you take care of it. And so I, all the time I'll walk around and I'll see, you know, a handful of brushes all stuffed in the water and just sitting there. That's bad for a couple of reasons. Number one is that as they sit there in the water, it can break the bristles down. Also, a lot of your brushes have painted handles and you can see this handle, all the paint's already starting to peel off here and there. And so that happens when it just sits in the water. So when you're working, take it out, dry it off, and set it down. Don't just leave every brush in your water. When you're cleaning your brushes, you know, most of the time you can just you know, run water through them and you can make sure that all the color is coming out. Um, don't use really hot water because the bristles are actually glued in here. And so hot water can actually break down that glue and you'll start losing the hairs. And so warm water is okay, but just not hot water. So um, think about that. Then if you ever need to really clean pigment out, like some of the pigments tend to stain more than others, you can put a, a little drop of either dish soap or uh, liquid hand soap in there and with your, wet, your brush wet, you know, work this in there and, and everything. And once the suds is no longer colored, you know, then it's pretty clean. You can rinse it out and you're good to go. Okay, I'm going to talk about working wet on wet. So all I'm doing is taking water 
and I'm putting water down on my paper. One of the neat things about watercolor pigment is it will follow the water, but it won't go past it. Not by itself, you know, you have to brush it past it. Now I'm going to take, this is a uh, phthalo blue, I'm just going to put it down and let the water start moving it around. And I can tilt this, tilt it up a little bit, and that will increase its movement. While it's still wet, I can take other colors. I'm going to take a little bit of crimson. Now watercolor paper tends to be fairly heavy, otherwise it will warp like crazy. And this is kind of on the light side, and so it still will warp a bit. But uh, you can't draw, but you can't paint very well with watercolor on, say, drawing paper, which is usually you know, maybe 80 pounds. This is like 125 pounds, I think. But this also has quite a texture, and you'll notice that the pigment will start to, to deposit uh, itself in the texture, and that's one of the things that gives it some of its uh, interesting qualities. Okay, this is the phthalo green. Okay, now if I have puddles of water, I can take just a paper towel and as I put it down, it will absorb a large portion of that water along with some of the pigment. Okay, and at this point, I'm simply going to set this aside and let it dry. This is a, one that I was working on a little bit earlier, and so you can see how it has the pigment settling in some of the dimple, dimples, uh, the texture of the piece. And so at this point, I can take a much drier brush with not nearly as much water. Now that, the, now that the paper's dry, I can take my brush and just start adding pigment to it. Now this side is 
going to be fairly cool because I'm using blues and greens. So what I'd like to do is have a fusion of the cold side to the warm side. This is the watercolor that I did earlier, at least this part here. It was wet on wet, so now that it's dry, I just came in and I took my water and I just put water on this area down here, filled this in with water, and then I decided what I want to do, since this was mostly blue with a little bit of green, that I would take green and fill in here. And so I let the green just kind of flow with everything. And then I started adding the red and the blue, just so that it would complement both sides. And so there I left a halo of dry paper right in between, and that way they never mixed, and um, I was able to keep everything se separate. But being able to use the wet on wet technique means that the pigments do some uh, very interesting things. You get these little lines going out uh, that are just, you can't do that by yourself, you just have to let the paper and, and the water and the pigment do that together. So this is one way of doing a non-objective abstract where you use wet techniques and um, I think it unifies it fairly well.